Hey guys, welcome back to Break the Gate Podcast. We got Jeremy Weiss, who is a uh, jack of all trades, just to name a couple of the different things he is. Uh, he's founder of Launch Music Conference. He's the owner of CI Companies. He's also an in-house talent buyer for uh, HMAC, which is the House of Music, Arts, and Culture. And I know you do a bunch of different things, but did I get most of that right? <laughs> Yeah, 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 definitely. Cool, man. I liked uh, all things music since I was a little kid. Yeah, great, awesome. Well, I was just about to say, uh, let's get into a little bit uh, about your journey, how you got into where you're at right now. Um, When I was a teenager, I, I, I was obsessed with my father, had been in a band like before he became a rural family doctor okay and and it was always kind of like this uh investigation i was conducting when i was in from like fifth grade through like maybe 12 12 years okay. old so i just thought it was so cool that he was in a band and yeah. then i started bands that were really bad my brothers had been in uh, like into punk and and things like that some sure. early metal so i had kind of like this you know want to be a little bit like them kind of thing going on so I think when I was really young, I got into like real DIY, the earliest like DIY music. And really, I mean, it was do it yourself because labels saw no commercial value in this music. Um, yeah. And I, I think from there, as I did that deeper dive and I would write letters and I would mail order stuff, kind of got to know more and more about how that's accomplished. Really fell in love with like the raw sound of the music and stuff and mm-hmm. the social justice issues so i would reach out to some of these people i idolized uh, ask them you know where do you press a record how do you do this how do you do that it wasn't certainly wasn't uh the sophisticated uh nationwide or global distribution the the nationwide and global distribution occurred in my parents basement sure where i would hand write letters back to people who I'd be lucky enough to have ordered one of the records yeah, I released. Right, right. <laughs> and then I just started answering similar calls to like do concerts. These bands were playing. I was too young to drive. Um, really, the stuff was considered to be like rough, even though it was really positive mm-hmm. and, and I couldn't get rides. So I started thinking about, well, how can I put on a show here? And I just started doing concerts around 15 years old. And, yep and just kind of grinding that out. I ended up going to college, completing a four year degree, but that was, uh, I studied topics that I was really interested in and I'm grateful for it. But that was also kind of, because at that time, you really kind of owed it to your, your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you were in a position to go to school, to finish school. This was not a career is what I'm trying to establish. It was like this sure. kind of seek, I was just seeking out like all of these experiences that my early punk rock idols were having and and um next thing i knew i guess you'd call it just kind of like being bit by a bug and this is what i want to do yeah yeah what did you go to school for um well i started i took three years of business which makes a lot of sense to most people Uh, yeah but i had taken a lot of um electives in what we called black studies. So I ended up a black studies major. I I thought I was going to solve like uh, all the world's problems with regard to race (laughs) by learning, you know, from some brilliant people who marched with King and X and, you know, and I I, I loved every second of, it was like, you know, everything was all brand new. Um, But I'd say that has uh, been very applicable for me when I subsequently was tour managing or touring and, and going around, you know, I think four continents, you know, having a better understanding of uh, what makes people tick and, and dispelling all these like mysterious things being from like a pretty small, like rural area, you know? Yeah. So Uh, I wouldn't change the thing. Yeah. Uh, on the, uh, it's a little bit off topic, but on the subject of black and African American culture, have you ever watched Godfather of Harlan? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, dude, <laughs> yeah. it is such yeah. a good Great TV show. show. <laughs> <clears throat> Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I try yeah. to tell as many people yeah, about it as possible. You know, <laughs> it, yeah. it, they do, they do such a good job <laughs> of going into the history of everything. I, it blew my mind. Right. And this is like a ridiculous and incredibly naive thing to say, but I, in my wildest fantasies, I wish like there were people who booked tours of the 
of all 53 countries in Africa, yeah. you know, so that I can get over there and, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and see it the way I saw Europe and Asia. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Bummer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So could you but go into... I will get there someday. Yeah. Could you go into a little bit about what uh, inspired you to start Launch um, and kind of how it plays a role into the industry today? Yeah, and and I have to say, I I came into, it took me 10 years to call it an industry, you know, because it it really is when you come out of indie music, it's, believe me, I've been calling it now an industry for longer than 10 years but when you get into it because it's something you absolutely love and you have this like craven desire to be a part of it and to help create like be part of this creative community um there's a reason i'm I'm bringing this up when you have those ambitions and they're they're not really you're not allowing yourself to to think like oh this is going to be my job you know because it doesn't it doesn't feel like one uh when you're so inspired anyway um i knew also that it was just difficult to get information outside of my community i alluded to a moment ago you know i called ian mckay from discord records and asked him where do you press a record when i was 14 and a half 15 years old that's not really happening right i mean Mm. of course you you can internet search but if you think about it uh kind of a if you try to equate the times you never know if you're making the right decision you'd benefit from someone else having already done said searches maybe made some mistakes and and you can learn some things from them so in that regard you know i i realized how fortunate i was to have been part of a music community that was a much more tight-knit organic kind of undertaking uh more charitable you know in, mm-hmm. in their thinking uh but you know, as I started tour managing bands and I was traveling quite a bit, uh, 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 quite a few of them would play at the earliest South by Southwest. They play at something called the Mac Conference in Virginia. They play in CMJ, which used to be College Music Journal, it used to be huge, and they would take over Manhattan for a week at all these different venues. I, I was blown away. I said, oh my gosh, this isn't just like a date on the tour. This is like a whole thing where they're bringing like minded people together and and uh, industry professionals are, are kicking some knowledge. And boy, this feels kind of like the community I grew up in. This sounds really cool. But we also knew that as South By grew into this phenomenal, amazing event, it, it was less intimate and it was harder to break through. We also knew that Northeastern bands were having an extremely uh, huge financial obstacle to get their butts down there and, and so forth and so on. And and the gatekeeping kind of started happening. It was harder to get on showcases. It was it was harder to make a mark. Um, even though it's a magnificent product, it's 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 a great event. Uh, it's really not their fault. They're so huge, you know. But we wanted to try something up here, kind of like a north by northeast and and that's really how Launch was born. It was a partner and I at the time, a really good friend of mine that uh we just decided yeah let's try it and we sat down and and started writing out our entire plan and we went and procured a facility we at that time you know we're in our 30s so we knew a good few a good many people who would all who would also like come and and we knew they were credible and and they would help us out in this first tight year or two with panels and such we had a really great response to the first year it probably took about five years to for people to really understand what the hell it even is, though. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as a festival organizer, could you go into a little bit of the challenges? And we know, and we talked about this offline a little bit, but could you go into a little bit more of what it's, uh, what kind of challenges you face when and when putting together such a large scale event? I mean, you've got bands playing, you've got speakers. You know, could you go into a little bit of that? It is, uh, I'll try to really confine this to a, a, a brief <laughs> answer, but it, it really is unimaginable. Um, and just, we've been, I've been in a learn by doing culture since my first day I fell in love with music. And that's why I think Launch has taught all of us in the office as much about the industry as it's taught people who are coming to learn from it. Just by doing constantly, that's been the model here at at CI companies for since I was a kid just learn by doing it so when we get started we think 
oh my gosh, we need a print guide. Oh my gosh, we, we probably should have like a compilation record. Oh my gosh, we need sound systems for 11 stages. Holy crap, we need, you know, mm. it, it, everything down to even like the change for the $5 cover or whatever, designing badges, does it getting uh, lanyards, everything all established, ready to go, perfect. I'm a bit obsessive about those things. I really think the details are what makes people remark like, wow, that was an outstanding event. So we're kind of obsessive in that regards, probably a reflection of my weirdness, but you'll get, you know, 30 <laughs> emails telling you exactly what to do and how to do it before you arrive. And, and we have a real good rate of success with like the transfer of information. The biggest challenge for it is you are literally setting up an entire daytime program like a curriculum if you will and you're you're entertaining 45 to 60 music professionals from all over the country some from europe some from canada a couple from asia have come and and there's a lot to that that i, I mean it's kind of boring to the average person but right down to like the logistics of gathering them from the airport returning them to etc and getting them acclimated and then you're trying to explain to a couple thousand people what they should be paying attention to during the daytime, like kind of uh, industry uh, portion, the educational portion. Well, then at night, no big deal, right? I mean, there's a couple thousand bands here. We may as well like put 150 to 200 of them on stages. And that gets really grueling as well because you're, you're inviting all of these groups after you've listened to every single one and there are eight of us and we have rules on how many ear, eyeballs have to be on the video and ears have to be on the music and then everybody does their notes and we winnow it down. Say there's 150 spots, we'll have like 160 choices and there'll be 10 alternates there. They all have to respond before we can do the next thing so you could have 146 of them confirmed and and you just uh, four people are just dragging their feet having no idea that they're delaying the entire announcement for everybody so a lot of things have to be fiercely coordinated there are a lot of people involved sometimes just on a very specific like really time sensitive topic um it's exhausting it's a great kind of exhaustion and it's true when you get through it, you're like, I don't know if I'm going to do that again. And within like six hours or maybe 16, you've had some good rest and you're back home. Mm -hmm. All you do is just wax poetic about how great it was and how much fun it was. And for the folks that really deride like value from it, it's everything. It really is. And then, of course, at night, it's 150 bands is a huge party, too. So it's not boring. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So moving over to HMAC a little bit, uh, could you go into the process of booking um, artists for that venue? Well, that was a lot of learn by doing to get there. Yeah, because I'd done a few thousand shows by then, I would imagine. Um, for HMAC, you know, you need to be kind of, you need it, it, my best advice, because I did it the other way for most of my life. Uh, I would book at venues, but I didn't work in any capacity for the venue. So that can get complicated from time to time. Some people can get kind of pissy about, you know, who has the hold and whose date it is. And maybe somebody woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And they want to bump your show that you've already been promoting. So I think at this station in my career, my life, I, I, the last couple times I was like, look, I mean, I have to be the like house talent buyer. I don't want any smoke from back from, you know, who's this guy from an agent or or someone else coming in saying, I'd like to book too. At least the house talent buyer knows like all of the things that are being booked in the room. So you can avoid like things you, you want to come through that you didn't book, but you want them to happen there. You have total knowledge of all the dates and stuff. And I really enjoy that kind of peace of mind. Adds a lot, adds a lot of work. Sure. You know, you're not just calling and saying to you Friday the 12th open, you're checking every day, like calendars and ticket counts and announcements and, and things of that nature. What I like about that venue so much is that it is, uh, it's an amalgamation of like some of the hundreds of venues I went through on as a performer and a tour manager and, and, I really love that it has a 300 capacity room and then 
totally in a different location. It's like 50,000 square feet. There's an 1100 cap room. And then in the middle, so to speak, there's an enormous like wide open high ceilings bar and restaurant. And I, I think that really gives me that like communal vibe that I that I crave when you're doing a show. People show up a couple hours early. So I really did, I think, pick a really nice spot to settle into the last few years. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a little bit of flexibility too on artists. You know, for some in-house talent buyers, they may uh, be an in-house for a 1100 cap venue and that's their cap. You know, they can't necessarily book the, you know, the touring band that's, you know, maybe done your market twice, you know, but they but for you, you could book that same band and then that very you know, you could also book like uh, state champs or something like that. You know, it's somebody else who who yeah. could fill out that 1100 cap room. So you're in a, a very good and lucky position because not a lot of people have that. I totally agree with that. Um, it, it's a very difficult thing to just build out of thin air and credit you know, to the owner for pulling that one off. Um, I was you I. I mm -hmm. When I started, I was doing the Chameleon Club and I was doing what were like the first all ages venues. I mean, they thought they were uh, sorry, events. They thought they were just like a nightclub, you know, which makes total sense. And mm. uh, but I said, well, give me, you know, six to nine, six to nine thirty. I'll be in and out. Don't worry about it. And then he'd see five or six bands on the bill and he'd say, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, never go over in time ever. Well, there were even artists, you know, that were kind of they had the lizard lounge which held about 150 people but then the next room was 800 so there's a bit of a problem there because a 300 mm -hmm. cap band doesn't look so good in an 800 yep. but they're way too big for the 150 there was a guy in west shore of harrisburg all in central pa that's where my heart is uh had this terrific idea to start a place called the champ they were not doing well. I'd been booking some shows there that met this weird criteria I just mentioned. And um, after a while, I said, look, we're, we're just gonna call it. And I, I went and my partner from launch and, and I bought into that, the champ and wanted to keep it going for the reason you just described. I mean, if, if the champ hadn't been open and certainly was a labor of love, something I loved very, very much, no liquor license, uh, pretty much everyone under 25, but most of our demographic, you know, 19, 18 and under. Um, but that was a perfect springboard for the Chameleon Club, for the 800 cap. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I see HMAC. You know, you've got stage on her for 300 people and you can upstream when you know you need to upstream. The Champ did that for so many artists and I... I mention artists sometimes, but I don't assume everybody knows like every genre of music. But, you know, we came as Romans, uh, the word alive. Uh, uh, I know Sleeping with Sirens, we had Black Veil Brides, we had A Day to Remember. We had all of these artists when they were opening on smaller packages. And it was an amazing experience, of course, to like recall that, you know, these bands played for uh, smaller crowds and lower guarantees. But it, that was also the reason you could upstream them uh, into the next room. So I agree with you totally. Yeah. So uh, speaking of guarantees, uh, how do you negotiate yeah. what guarantees should be paid out to what artists? You know, you know, you know agents are because sometimes it can be called the used car salesman of the industry. You know, a lot of times they'll they'll try to sell you on a package that's probably not worth what they sh they say they are but they could be how do you know when it is well i'm a little different sometimes i think a lot of agents may not care for me um i'm not sure if what they're they're taking my candor um as an insult or something i'm not i'm not really entirely sure um i just think you know you do a proper assessment of your market so there can be a, an artist that you know crushes at 65 miles away in philadelphia and you really really want to bring them into your market you really really want to like build a second home for them there so maybe they weren't on a a tour of 
major markets and now they want to go back out on tour and they want to play secondaries like our smaller smaller than Philly and New York and Baltimore market. If you haven't built something there, it's like a big guessing game to see if that artist mm-hmm. is caught outside of these like two, three, four or five million, you know, uh, population cities. So I think sometimes when I'm extremely aware of like how great an artist is and how badly I'd like them to play my town, but I have to suggest a dollar amount that is not it's it's incongruent with what they get in these major markets. I I, I submit that sometimes they might get upset. Um, what I would say, or just think I'm an asshole. <laughs> what I would suggest <laughs> to people primarily is, you know, it's just like uh, someone telling you you're buying a home. Like, do not fall in love. You know, to the extent that you're going to be house poor. Um, mm-hmm. Colleague of mine, Kevin Lyman you know, would come to launch because he, he partnered with me for a few years and he was a guest a couple times in addition to that in launch. He he said, who here wants to be a promoter? And a bunch of people raised their hands. He's like, all right, take $25,000. I don't care how you get it. Borrow from grandparents, borrow from friends, take it out of your life savings or your college account. Put it in a brown paper bag and light it on fire. That's how you're going to learn to be a promoter. <laughs> I think that I was always careful to avoid that. I would close by saying, if you really love a band do you, you know you have to ask yourself do i want to buy the twenty thousand dollar ticket or do i want to buy the thirty dollar ticket like to the extent that i might lose eight thousand or i might just have to go to the show and enjoy it i i think i've always kind of chosen the latter there are things i've done as a labor of love please don't misunderstand but nothing that that was to the extent you know I'll have it like that where I could just burn twenty grand you know just just to see an artist that I really like, um, so it's a difficult time right now. I totally understand it. The music industry was the very 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 last uh, entity in in the in this entire economy that was not only permitted to come back but just that came back anyway. So if you really think about it, even the last COVID relief in the country was given to save our stages, you know, and, and the venue operators. So people are a little ravenous. I understand, you know, and artists are also confronted with, they didn't really tour. They were living off record revenue. This is a lot of things people have already heard, but I'm trying to give it a little more human twist, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. and I think they get out there and they're like, "I, I need to go out on tour and these are the things I need. Lastly, I think things what people don't think about are production values. We as a as a consumer outside, of course, like the DIY and like really punky stuff, we want to show, man. And we are really glamorizing that. And and I I like that genres like death metal and stuff are aren't pulling their punches when it comes to production and putting on a show. They're like Hey, Harry Styles is red, but I got a few tricks too. You know, I can entertain you visually as well. And and I, I think at, that comes at a price as well. So the fans, you know, to be fair, we're kind of demanding these extraordinary experiences, but then we're kind of don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so I do see both sides. But yeah, I think we have a bit of a problem with pricing right now. And I think we're settling down. I think we're you know, as we're pushing through halfway through 2023 and we've been open a solid two years, really, maybe a year and a half full time. I think things are starting to come back down to earth. Yeah, I think, uh, as you mentioned a little bit, too, uh, a lot of it has to do with the covid bubble. You know, um, nobody was touring for so long and now everybody's touring, you know, and of course, supply and demand doesn't right. stop when, you know, music wants to be heard. You know, you got. You know, like you said, the production costs, you got, you know, buses are, you know, are costing more, you know, some are not even available. Vans cost more, gas costs more, you know, even some things, simple things like guitar strings, you know, uh, you know, so Food. you kind of hit the head uh, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, and like you said, you know, it does um, seem like it might be dwindling, dwindling down a little bit. Um, I, uh, I guess I just uh, kind of hope that... Uh, some of the younger agents recognize that um, as the industry changes on a financial level that uh, they should be adapting as well. Because otherwise, there could be a scenario to where they might burn their artist out uh, 
in a local scene financially. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want to book this artist for five grand, but they only get three grand of income, the promoter would be less likely to work with you the next time. Mm-hmm. It's very true. I think everyone is going to have yeah. to start managing their excesses a bit, not just the ticket buyer. You know, the ticket buyer, mm-hmm. that's an easy one. I don't have the money. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm picking two out of the next six shows that I really would go to, but I don't have the money. Well, what, what, what could happen then, though, is those four other shows that person really would have gone to, like, you have to ask, what would have happened if they were each $6 cheaper? You know, would that at least have uh, provided enough for them to go to, like, two of those four remaining shows? Not really sure. We'll find out. I do think as a, you know, on a macro scale, we flooded a lot of money into our economy to like keep it going during a very difficult time. And we're all pigs and we all raise the price on everything across the board. As soon as we were told that there are shortages or, or that people need our help, whatever the case may be, you know, for the wrong and the right reasons. Some people were gouging, you know, saying oh, we're open for business. Other people were really leaning very heavily on, hey, I had a very difficult year and a half. I think now people will be like, we all had a pretty difficult year and a half and <laughs> and things will come down this back down the earth a little bit. People are touring a ton and you're seeing legacy acts that you, haven't, you didn't even know would ever play another show again. And that's also, I think it might be a mental thing like, hey, everyone almost died or they told us maybe, you know, that everyone might die. So I don't want I don't yeah. want that fight. Um, and <laughs> and I'm nostalgic and I want to go out and leave one final mark, you know, but I think the rest of them are also taking a look at the complete and utter decline of of music sales, you know, that we're all streaming. It's magnificent. We're learning about tons more bands. We're revisiting material much more often. There's nothing bulky to carry around or you didn't forget to bring the CD into the car and all that stuff. However, you know, yeah, I think it's also hitting their bottom line. So that's another reason bands are touring. I think there might be an emotional and a financial component to it, but that means more competition um, in by market and in all of these markets. And I agree with your assessment. I think it's it's gonna it's gonna calm down a little bit here soon. Yeah, yeah. I really like that you brought up the uh, brown bag uh, analogy from um, or as an anecdote analogy Lyman, from Kevin. Kevin uh, yeah, yeah. So I yeah. had him on the podcast um, um, as well, and I'm ninety five percent sure that he also said the same thing on the podcast in terms yeah. of how, <laughs> there you go. yeah. So it's really cool. Um, so in, See in how that, important footnotes are, guys? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I could have gotten burned if I tried yeah. to take that as my own, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so on that note, do you have any advice for anybody who's trying to become a promoter? Sure. I, I think that everything I've ever done, I've managed like my risk to a kind of an insane degree. And it kind of, you know, borrows from what I was saying earlier about like, do you want the twenty thousand dollar ticket or the or the thirty dollar ticket to the show? I think that I've done some things. I've really had to work extremely hard because I really wanted this thing to work, and was out there really pounding the pavement, begging, borrowing, stealing people to come to shows. But the risks have always been manageable they wouldn't be something that would like destroy my entire existence. Those risks get bigger and bigger and bigger as your, as your career chugs along. And, you know, so that may be true. Cause I don't want to sound like pretentious. You know, some of the risks I take now are, are certainly several five figures long, but, but even back then, everything has to be managed about what you can, uh, comfortably lose or or even just uncomfortably lose like what you're willing to to give up you know in the off chance that the that, that things should fail i think it's really important also to not be prideful i don't know how prevalent this is now it seems kind of prevalent but people want to be a promoter and they're they're injecting um themselves kind of into the show right like i did this i promoted this um the history of 
putting little emblems and stuff on things was because a lot of us were bringing artists no one had ever heard of. So first time I booked Jimmy World, they were 40 bucks and I really thought they were amazing and I really wanted people to come and see them. So I had to remind them, hey, I'm the guy who, you know, brought you uh, Juliana Theory with My Chemical Romance last month and you really liked that show. You trusted me then, so trust me now, you know, and that's li literally how it was meant to go. I don't see a problem with a presenting person, but I would really caution people not to uh, think they're the show. There is absolutely no show without basically your talent and then I'd say secondarily your venue and or techs and people who are producing the live audio and video experience. You're not the show. You're not the, the big time. Maybe that's why you hear some things about agents just going in on talent buyers because maybe there's too much hubris there. Maybe there's too much narcissism. I don't know. And the reason I said all of that was to simply say, ask other talent buyers or, or ask a former talent buyer, ask in forums online, please like do your due diligence. You know, no one likes to, you and I meet on a Friday night. We both bought used cars. They're pretty similar. Like you got the Toyota, I got the Honda. And I find out that I paid, you know, $4,000 more for the same exact specs of yours. That's no fun. Exactly. You know, nobody wants to go through that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to bring that up as well. Uh, if that's a good, <laughs> uh, a good way to uh, assess your market a little bit, or uh, more so, I guess, assess what a band should get on a guarantee um, is by asking other promoters and some of the other markets what they were going for. Is that good uh, business etiquette? Uh, do you feel like that doing that might be kind of shady a little bit? Or, or what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I know you touched I a little bit about it. There's trust involved. And I, I'm not going to tell you that you can just call like your main, who would be your main competitor and ask them how much they paid for a successful show. That's right. very naive. So it does take a little bit of time to do that relationship building. A lot of the things that I do is try to kind of, again, amalgamate like all the data I can possibly get. Obvious things that most of us know are like, oh, this band has 150,000 Facebook followers. Oh, they have like six engagements on their last seven months of posts. Maybe, maybe things aren't going as well. Let me, let me dip over to Instagram. Oh, Instagram's popping. Okay. Maybe I identified something. There might be something to it. Like, you know, they're just not working the Facebook page. Like they are this newer page that they're really into or technology that band members find easier. Maybe I go in and see that they have, you know, a hundred, uh, 1.6 million monthly listens on Spotify, but the streams aren't that impressive. Like there's only three, 4 million streams on a song. These are all like really literal examples. I hope they're not too boring, yep, nope, but perfect. they're free. So, <laughs> uh, exactly. but, you know, you can look at that and think, oh, well, a monthly listen is just a click on a, you know, if you do not actually skip a song on a, on a playlist, a large playlist, if you get one, two, five seconds into it, they get a monthly listener out of that. They get a stream uh, when it hits 30 seconds. So maybe they, someone did some really great work, got them on these huge podcasts. I'm sorry, uh, podcasts. <laughs> got them on these huge playlists. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of your yep. huge podcast. <laughs> um, get, they put get them on these playlists and then they're racking up monthly listens, but it's not really translating to like a fervor for the band. Other ways, there's an older way, Polestar, spend 500 bucks, you can get some ticket and sales data, anyone in the country, you know, of, of similarly sized markets. You should go to a lot of shows. Uh, I believe very much in that. I've gone to shows that are packed and I feel like no one knows why they're there and it was kind of like a real flash in the pan phenomenon. I've gone to shows that were really well attended and I'm seeing transcendent, like tearful, just super engaged people. I'm like, I want that band so bad, you know, because I'm becoming like that fan in the audience. I think a lot of the research is, is extremely important. 
I, I really do. So if I'm booking a band, I can get all this data together and I can make an educated guess and that's fine. And I think I'm very good at that. I mean, you should be if you're doing it 30 freaking years, right? I mean, why would you keep doing it, right? If you're that <laughs> bad at it. But I also like to book things on feel, you know, and like I described, I've been to shows where I'm like, oh my God, like this band is just life-changing for all of us in this room. I got to bring this to market. I got to show people. But now those acts, will they have the asset here. You can go and 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 pull YouTube videos and be like, look at that, you know. And you can you can pull live recordings. You can get them. A lot of times they'll engage fans better, so maybe they'll do a a vi- you know like a video drop for your show. There are a lot of factors like that as well too. So I don't want to make it all math, but there's there's kind of two ways to do it. Okay. Um, so you talked yeah. about a little bit earlier how, uh, with, especially with the launch of launch, no pun intended, or maybe, um, that uh, you were 30 around the time and you kind of already had a little bit of a foothold in the industry. So you, uh, it allowed you to be able to build something. Um, with that, I've noticed that networking is very important in the music industry. Um, could you go into a little bit of what your thoughts are on networking? You know, there's something about me that people probably think I'm full of shit. And I'm sorry, I, I'm not. Um, I think that relationships are really important. I also think that I've made some really like sincere and real connections with people in this music community. Sure, there's a lot of mean people. There's a lot of sharks in the water just like any other salesy industry but uh i've also made some really great connections maybe the infancy of that is a term we use as networking um because even then you can be this master networker but people kind of know that you practiced and you're kind of full of it right Mm -hmm. so i would encourage people without question there's nothing will ever replace FaceTime. Nothing will ever replace like sitting with someone and talking with them. And sometimes those connections have nothing to do with your ambition or your craft. And you're just kind of getting to know each other because the best corners of any industry are built with pockets of like-minded people. They work at the same pace. They work with the same degree of of detail or lack thereof. They have the same ambitions, whether it's it's pure profit or a, a kind of a mixture of art and, and prosperity. There are so many different like pockets within this industry that if you don't network, you can't even identify who's going to bring out the best in you and you're going to bring out the best in them. But there is no question in my mind, body and soul that networking is tantamount. If you are sitting at home waiting, I think you're host. I think you're not going to have very much of a shot. And that, if you can, I'm going to ask you a question. Name me an industry where what I just said isn't accurate, right? I mean, where they wouldn't benefit immensely (laughs) from getting out into their own field and undertaking to really meet people. There is no... Uh, industry, even in the engineering <laughs> field, uh, networking is key. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't have gotten half the roles I got uh, if I weren't for networking in some way. Do you hear that? Engineering, right? Most yeah. people have no idea what that even is. I mean, I have a really basic understanding of chemical and electrical engineering, meaning like what the role of, of those two types of engineering are. But honestly, even it, it, yes, even in engineering, right? That, that is across the board. It doesn't matter if you work at Pizza Hut, you mm-hmm. know, you're going to be talking to people and and making connections if you are if you would like to move up in that company. Um, in this regard, what I like about it is I'm meeting a lot of people that share my interests. Yes. You know, in other fields, our interests can often, you know, sadly, be outside of our line of work, right? I mean, I'd say that's fair for the lion's share of people. I don't mean they're miserable at work, but when you ask them what they did on the weekend, they didn't engineer. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Right? I know I said that in a funny way on purpose, but they they didn't do that. They went 
kayaking or skiing or <laughs> to a concert, right? But we're we're the luckiest people in the world. We played or listened or saw music. How, how freaking great is that? Yeah. You know. So that is why I think the we strangle we eat our own and we we kind of put this impossible idyllic standard and we just call it in the name of art i am a huge advocate of gosh if you don't like it don't do it like please because it it's certainly not a gravy train you're not moving you know bitcoin or or blue chip stocks here man and you know what the return is going to be it is can be very stressful and and really worrisome and you're doing it because you love it maybe not even all of the machination that goes into it but you love the result you love concerts you love live music you love the art form um so don't do it if you don't absolutely love it because outside of that i i don't really understand what we thought artists it's like this in sports and various kinds of entertainment as well. We judge each other so harshly. Oh, their last record went way down. Oh, did you see their tour numbers? They were shot. This isn't people talking about what to offer a band in compensation based on modern tick gate receipts. This is all of us meowing and pissing all over each other. And I, I, I don't understand that. On the same note, the massive idea that you're not anything until you're here, you know? And that is not something that I learned in my come up with underground music. Uh, My heroes were happy to bring a record to market that looked the way we wanted it to look, that sounded the way we wanted it to sound, and the success happened when it was completed and available. Everything else was kind of uh, residual gain. Now, that's a bit naive if you want to have a wife and 1,100 kids like me, but you still can maintain that balance of like not quantifying everything based on a person's, you know, fame or incredibly high financial success. I am in awe of a person that played two seasons in AAA baseball. It doesn't matter to me that they made four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and the next guy made five hundred million. They were doing something they absolutely freaking loved, and they were doing it at like the highest possible level within their skill set. And I think that's amazing. And that's I would encourage everyone in the music industry, especially musicians, to rethink that entire thing. It's in our DNA right now as a culture, fame trumps everything renown trumps everything and um if you really want to talk about art with me that's where my heart lies it's like yeah. you brought something out that moved x amount of people you, you've really succeeded in that regard you did it to the best of your ability so that's where i think this romanticizing of of how well you're doing is based on how well you're known or how how many people are are really interested in you in some kind of star power thing whether you're a musician or a promoter or a club owner or anything like that and i think that's a huge mistake yeah um we talked about this the other day yes like so zuckerberg and elon musk are out there and they're famous billionaires and then of course like the most famous or infamous I'll let you decide which side of that I'm on. (laughs) Billionaire became a president, right? And like all this stuff, like, do you know how many other billionaires there are? I'll bet most people don't because most people just kind of make their money and and sit tight. And and we don't have to reduce that just to billionaires. We could talk about myriad successful people, hundreds of thousands of people that are doing just fine. I think that's a problem in the music industry is that we don't let people be successful doing what they love and they're not homeless and eating cat food, (laughs) you know, they're either nothing or they're all the way up. And I think we got to change that. Absolutely. So I'm going to go back a little bit to one of your earlier roles. Um, the director of East coast operations for artery. Uh, (laughs) could you go into a little bit about your, uh, about your experience with that and how you got to that role? Yeah, the weirdest thing about 
you know, the way that I became interested in what is now the music industry is um, everything that you did was sort of out of necessity and also out of like feeding a need that no one else was going to fulfill. So in modern times, it can look like, uh, oh, just this control freak who has to have his or her hand in everything. But that's really not the case at all. I had begun booking tours uh, for myself and some of my friends' bands because who the hell was going to book our tours? Nobody, right, right? Right. So I had been booking for a very long time to the extent that when I was putting out records by small bands which are my favorite ones, the ones you find and you're like, you're a freaking genius. Please let me be a part of this. We'll probably make zero dollars and zero cents and we'll probably actually lose money. But my gosh, this is so good, right? Well, you still have to give it the old try. So we form a booking agency mm -hmm. and we put CI booking out there. And we're then, you know, for launch artists, what can we do to elevate them in, in stature? Like, how can we give them another opportunity to shine or to share their, their magic? And we were doing launch tours. And these are all like small undertakings. Guarantees are low. And, and people are just kind of, I'm working with the right community of people, you know, that pocket I spoke of. And, and we're doing cool stuff. And I think that's when I got really connected, you know, with the former owner of Artery out there. And, and, and I was talking about, he said he wanted an East Coast presence. And, and we said, yeah, let's just uh, switch it from CI to, to Artery. Yeah. Um, again, I mean, the CI thing was to lend as much possible renown or credibility. I'm not saying it's big, 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 but you know, it was bigger than the bands, you know, sure. like, so, Hey, it's us, you know, it's going to be good. Well, artery was bigger than us too. Mm -hmm. So we got an opportunity to elevate a lot of our roster. Um, I would like to see more mixing of the agent, various agents, like putting bands out together. I think that would have been something that I would have enjoyed more. And it's probably ultimately why I, my interest in it waned a little mm -hmm. bit. I kind of thought that, uh, oh, this Midwest band will, you know, they'll start out there and, and then they'll make it over here to some of our East Coast bands and everyone will benefit along the way, mm -hmm. you know, sharing markets and stuff. Show swapping. Not a lot of that happened. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. It, it's kind of like a tour that is bookended with show swaps. Yeah. yeah. And really kind of grow those bands that way. But it is interesting. Um, you know, got a few extra answers on the phone, got a few extra looks, you know, mm -hmm. from agents. It's always intriguing to see that they they did a good they did good work building their brand and they put out a lot of quality stuff and and that was very helpful for us. And I yep. met a really good friend of mine to this day who's running Dynamic now um, through Artery, so I can't complain. Yep. Yeah. So Trevor. Yeah, yeah, Trevor Swenson. Yeah, Good yeah, dude. yeah. I just had him on the podcast as well. So, <laughs> no way. That's amazing. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. That's. I, I swear, I, I did not like look up whoever was. <laughs> all of, I, I don't mean that in a in an arrogant way either. But it seems kind of like something's up here. Yeah. Like, but no, I'm serious. I guess we just both know really nice people. Yeah, exactly. That's. I think that's what it is. I think uh, I've spent enough time in the music industry as as you have. You've twice in maybe three more times more but uh to know who like the good guys were you know the ones who were actually trying to make a difference in the industry and that, i kind of resonated with that and and that kept me you know uh it, it reminded me of that you know like every time um i thought about oh okay who's killing it right now in the game oh it's got to be trevor or you know it's got to be you know yeah. kevin lyman yeah. you know or even his daughter's now doing stuff um you know as a day-to-day -day manager um, and, um, her and I still talk too, you know, cause you know, I just attach myself to people yeah. who are generally just trying to make a difference in the industry versus somebody who's just trying to, you know, flip those pancakes, you know, get just as much as, fa as fast as possible, but get, get people out the door, make money, that type of thing, you know, cause those people, they come and go. I, I, I agree. Yeah. You yeah. don't enter. I'm sure Kevin says something similar, but this is not an industry you, you get into, get in, get out, you know, like to flip. <laughs> you can get yep. really burned very quickly, you know. If I exactly. I can think of so many times someone did one show and they crushed it. Like, hey, man, congratulations. And they're like, I'm unstoppable. 
<laughs> I don't know. Yeah, about yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> like, so, do a couple more. A yeah, we'll see where you. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, Not uh, really a wise choice of words. Right, right. right. So I think you got time for one more question. <laughs> um, so we haven't talked about it yet, but you also do CI records. Um, could you go into a little bit about the selection process as a record label owner uh, when bringing artists onto your roster? I have to say that every record on my label is just something this guy likes a lot. So there is a lot of... Uh, yeah, a lot of people like to say this, but if, if everybody just spent, you know, five seconds on each song, they would they would know immediately that there's a bit of range there that's mm-hmm. that's kind of strange. But it's all stuff that, that I love because I'm a complete music nerd and I like a lot, a lot of different stuff for different reasons. Um, so it starts with, yes, I like it. You know, that that is true. But they're, they're, we're a little different. We really want to make sure that we don't care if you've quit your day job. Matter of fact, I don't want you to drop out of school or do anything too drastic, but I like to find out just how much do you really want this to work? Mm. It's really great. It's totally okay for you and I to get together on a weekend twice a year and play a friend's barbecue and somebody's birthday party and maybe a 200, 400, $500 gig at like the local pub. But please don't, bring that to me Mm -hmm. you know let's let's really think about this um entrepreneurs in the music industry are are almost all of us and and we are risking it all and we're not going to remind you of that every day it's nothing like that but i really need to know that you have enough risk in you as well and you have enough hunger in you as well so i think a lot of it is very personal um, honest to goodness. And even to the extent that we've talked three, four, five times, we've identified, you know, who the leadership in the, in the act is and who's going to kind of be the spokesperson for efficient reasons on day to day stuff. Um, but we also, even to, when we finally issued a, an offer, you know, I've always said this for years, like there's a mandatory 72 hours, like I'm not going to talk to you. Like you need to go talk to other people. You need to be thoroughly convinced that this is ethical and a good thing for you and et cetera. Um, as far as like the other parts of the process, I mean, I've always loved being an incubator for a very unknown artist. So I, I have really enjoyed that. I really enjoy that discovery and I really enjoy, I, I am gratified when I'm like, see, I still, I got it, man. Like I, I knew, I knew that was something that was special. So, you know, we August Burns Red was signed off of a cassette demo that they'd written. You know, after being a band for four or five months, it was completely different from the music we had been releasing in that period on the label at the time. But I heard it, and I, I of course, I knew it wouldn't be the best thing they ever did, but I, I knew it was absolutely amazing an amazing start same thing in that genre with texas in july and 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 a few other acts you know with life in mind and and where the ocean meets the sky these groups were were exceptional by my estimation gladiators etc over on the other side you know you're hearing about this band kicking like actually managing to distinguish themselves in the in the music city of nashville Mm -hmm. you know really getting people buzzing about it like actually knowing what they're doing and then I'm hearing stories about how they're sleeping in the New York subways to save money on, um, you know, when they go up there to save money on hotels so they can play like two or three of the five boroughs over a four day period and just really like killing themselves to get it out there. I knew they wouldn't be long suffering. There's no way with that kind of work ethic and talent you know that the pink spiders wouldn't be offered something really cool mm-hmm. something yeah and they did they had a, a phenomenal run and they're they're coming to my town uh through ci and phantom power on thursday night i'm really excited about them so like there are a variety of reasons if i love the music and i also really believe in the person's drive and their passion for like getting it out there um lastly i need to point out that we're not like a long-term stop we can be, and there are several bands that I, you know, we're like their Warner Brothers Led Zeppelin. Like we'll put out every record, um, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what the balance sheet says or anything like that. Um, if you know, if we're really 
dialed in together personally and musically. But mostly I'm thinking about giving people a chance to enjoy some label services mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, I'm an old guy, so I know a lot of people. Maybe I can really move the needle for them, get them upstreamed, get them in front of a lot of eyeballs at friends who do festivals and book clubs and things like that and agents and, and really try everything in my power in that regard as well but not nail them down to you know three four or five albums like they can come in and sort of get in get out in that respect as well so it really is an affable kind of friendly agreement yeah. you know to work together Absolutely. that's how the label works okay yeah cool man well you've provided yeah. a lot of really valuable information uh, i think this is probably one of the best podcasts we've done in a while um <laughs> so uh, ah. Thanks. Yeah, man. I'd love to have you on again. Um, but for now, this is it. Um, yeah, we'll definitely uh, we'll figure it out. We'll get we'll get a part two out there. and We'll do another hour or something, and we'll just you know <laughs> ask more questions, and maybe you can ask me questions. And that was one of the things that I liked about Trevor too, because when I uh, had him on the podcast, he was starting to ask me questions, and that was like caught me off guard. And I was like, this yeah. is why I like you. <laughs> <laughs> So. Well, it's true though. I mean, everybody has to ask themselves, "Would I buy this?" Right. That's the that's the worst problem in all of business. Yeah. You know, the if you build it, they'll come kind of thing. It's just, I get it. You're so impassioned. You think this thing is such a phenomenal product or idea. Right. And the public doesn't care. It, it, life isn't fair. Right. And I like to ask people questions, especially people who know as much as you do. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I think there's a big mistake people think is experts mean that you know or people who just know a lot mean that they're done sure like, right. being curious they're done learning it's so ridiculous yeah I yeah, just, uh, yeah. Yep. all right jeremy i appreciate you coming on man um yeah i like i said great having you on great talking with you uh talk to you soon thanks right. no